Okay, well, welcome back, folks. We are winding down our study of the Ozarks. Uh, we have been going through this for a few months, and we are down uh, to the last two presentations. Today, we're going to talk about the Great Depression, and uh, then next week, we're going to talk about what's generally referred to as the pub public enemy era. If you don't know anything about the Ozarks, you're probably maybe surprised that we were kind of one of the centers of the uh, period of time in the in the United States during the early 30s, where all these gangsters like uh, Pretty Boy Floyd and Ma Barker and her boys and uh, some of these people like this not only called the Ozarks home, they stayed around here quite a bit, Bonnie and Clyde. So uh, it's going to be a really interesting time. Uh, and then after that, I'm just talking to Rochelle, we're going to start a whole brand new set of presentations, uh, which are going to be centering on the music of the 50s and the 60s. I call it the soundtrack of our youth. And uh, it's going to be just a blast. We're going to have so much fun. We're going to listen to songs. We're going to hear the stories about the singers and the songwriters and uh, talk about the times and um Kind of go back and and refresh our memory of our youth, and uh, it. I don't know. Like I said, we told Rochelle, it may not be socially uh, redeeming. We may not have anything really good lessons to learn, but we're going to have a blast. So I hope you tune in. Hope you tell your friends about it because I think you'll really enjoy it. I've been working really hard on this. So today we're going to talk about the Great Depression. Now. I could probably sit back and let some of you do a better job talking about this than I can. I, I will be honest. I'm not a child of the Great Depression. I was born in 47. My mom and dad obviously went through the Great Depression, as did my grandparents. And I, I felt the effects of that in my home. But I don't have any clear recollection of the Great Depression itself. And I know some of you out there probably have a much clearer uh, idea of what happened during the Great Great Depression than I do. So, you know, again, uh, I'm sure some of you could do a better job relating this to other people than I can. But nevertheless, we're going to we're going to look at it and we're going to see what we can see about the Great Depression. Um, first of all, the time period is often called the contrasting decades, the 20s and the 30s. Uh, a lot of people refer to the Roaring Twenties and the Dirty Thirties. Uh, they call them the Dirty Thirties, of course, is because of uh, the Great Dust Bowl period out in the uh, Plain States. And it was just a, if, if there's ever been two decades in history, in American history, that are any more different, I can't imagine what they would be. The Roaring Twenties, you had this, this spirit of modernity that, that broke loose after World War I. Uh, you had so many new inventions like the automobiles, the telephones, electricity, which were beginning to just really encompass all the United States. Uh, you had rapid industrial growth. You had people beginning to make more money. Uh, it fired the economy up. Culture uh, just completely broke away from all the old norms. And you have the jazz age, the flappers, art deco, moving pictures. Folks, the, the Roaring Twenties was just an amazing decade for changes. But then we have the decade that followed it, the 30s. And it just kind of just blew the 20s away. Uh, you had this worldwide global economic crisis, and it was worldwide. It wasn't just in the United States. Uh, just completely devastated the international financial system, uh, you had widespread poverty, unemployment, uh, the breadbasket of the United States, the Great Plains, Canada, I mean, pardon me, Kansas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma, Texas, those states were just absolutely almost destroyed by the dust bowl and the drought. The barter system, which had kind of begun to drift away, kind of came back. Uh, Society also changed backwards. It saw a return to all the traditional culture and religious values, uh, which had kind of been just thrown away after World War One during the during the twenties. So it was a it was a really 
strange 20 years here between the roaring 20s and the dirty 30s. And of course, that culminated in the Great Depression in the 30s. Now, the Ozarks was not immune from any of this, although it wasn't, it didn't exactly embrace either the roaring 20s and and luckily we escaped some of the you know really worst of the dirty 30s um the ozarks and particularly the springfield area if you're not familiar with it has always been one of these kind of areas that just kind of drifts along at an even keel we very seldom experience the highs we very seldom experience the lows um so while there may be ups and downs in our society and our economic system, uh, we tend to kind of keep an even keel, uh, which in my way of thinking is a pretty good thing. So here's two, I mean, boy, this picture says it all, does it not? You got the roaring 20s, you got the flappers, uh, you got the jazz age, you got, you know, just, you know, a time to let loose after World War I, and then that disintegrates into the 30s where people were just devastated economically and socially. It just was just a horrible time. Uh, so again, two really contrasting decades. So what we have to ask ourselves is exactly what happened. Um, well, the Great Depression, I said, was just a worldwide economic uh, downturn lasted at least the decade of the 30s probably would have lasted much longer had it not been for world war ii it's you know folks as, as tragic as it is and as horrible to think about it usually economic depressions are solved by wars you know it and that's exactly what happened uh, so what happened in the 20s or pardon me, the 30s. Well, we had a drop in industrial production of 47%. That's the most 50% of the industrial production of the country disappeared in a matter of years. We had a drop in the gross domestic product. That's the kind of the total of all the wealth in the country of 30%. Uh, so almost a third. Uh, a drop in the wholesale prices of 32%. Now, you may say, well, that must have been okay because that meant the prices of things came down. Yeah, the reason the prices of things came down is nobody had any money to buy anything. So they had to come down. A reduction in foreign trade of 70%. Foreign trade all but ceased to exist in the, in the Depression era. A rise in employment of 20%. Now, let's put that in perspective. You know, some of you, my age probably you know this is hard for us to comprehend but let's think back to just a few short years ago 2007 to 2009 and when we went through what is generally referred to as the great recession uh, if you don't know the difference between a depression and a recession there's no saying uh, a, a, a recession happens to your neighbor a depression happens to you you know, a recession is nothing more than just a little bit easier uh, downturn. So let's compare the statistics. Whereas in the 1930s, you had industrial production of drop of 47%, it went down 25% in this two-year period, three-year period of 2007-2009. So almost 50% less. A drop in the GDP of 4.3% compared to 30% during the Great Depression. Drop in wholesale prices of less than 1%. So the prices of goods really didn't change much during the Great Recession um, because people still did have resources to a degree. A drop in foreign trade of 15%, and that was considered, I mean, I can remember people just talking about how horrible we just lost all our foreign trade and it was only 15 percent think about the great depression went down 70 percent and finally a rise of unemployment of 4.5 percent so i think it ended up being a total of about eight or nine percent for the total time period compared to 20 percent during the great depression and folks there were areas 
that the Great Depression, the unemployment was a lot worse than 20 percent. Um, I can guarantee you there were places in the United States where the great where the unemployment rate was probably closer to 40 to 50 percent compared to 20 percent. But that was a nationwide statistic. So as you can see, really how bad the Great Depression was, if you if you don't already know in your minds. Um, so what caused all this? You know, and I don't want to get into the weeds here because I am not an economist. I have a working understanding of economics, but I, I am not an economist and I can't uh, really get into it. But basically, you can boil the causes for the Great Depression down to four basic reasons. And uh, those reasons are still with us and we still see them to some degree. The first one uh is an unequal distribution of wealth. Now, we still have that in this country. We know that. We know that the wealth of this country is primarily located in the hands of a very small minority. But it was nothing compared to what it was in the 1930s. Uh, you had people living in Biltmore mansions. Now, admittedly, that's an excessive one. And yet most people lived like this family down here, that happens to be, the little girl happens to be my mother. And she lived in a little town called Dora, Missouri, uh, in Douglas County. And, um, you know, that's the home that she lived in for grandma and grandpa, because her dad died, or pardon me, her dad uh, abandoned the family early and her mother died and left her basically an orphan at the age of about 11. And she was raised by her grandmother and grandfather. And that that's that was not that unusual, folks. People lived in places like that. A lot of people did in the Ozarks. But back in the 20s, 30s, pardon me, less than one tenth of one percent of the wealthiest people in America can, had more wealth than the bottom 42 percent of Americans. That, think about that for a minute. One tenth of one percent of the people at the very top had more wealth than the bottom 42%. Now, it's not that bad today. Uh, it, it's more equalized out, but it's still primarily in the hands of, of you know, wealthy people. An industrial worker's annual average income in 1929 was $750. That was an industrial worker. That was somebody that had a good job. You look at somebody that was a farmer and their average uh, income was about $273 a year. That means, you know, $22, $23 a month, maybe. And that's the average. I can guarantee you there were a lot of farmers didn't have $20 and $30 a month coming in. A lot of them didn't have anything coming in. You know, it was just, I mean, they, they, they were subsistence farmers. Henry Ford made $14 million in 1929. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. Well, it seems like a lot of money to me, you know. But in comparison to what people are making today that are really rich, that seemed like nothing. You know, Bill Gates probably lights his cigars with $14 million bills, you know. I mean, I don't know. Bill Gates probably doesn't even smoke. But, you know, I'm, I'm just being silly here. But, you know, the whole point of it is Henry Ford made a lot of money in 1929, and he really didn't pay much taxes on that. Uh, most of that was tax-free. In 1929, 200 corporations in America controlled over 50% of America's wealth. That means over 50% of America's wealth was in the hands of 2,200 companies. Now, again, that can be said to some degree in America today, but not nearly to that degree. You know, I can guarantee it's not quite that bad. So. The second cause, stock market speculation. Well, the stock market was still relatively a new thing at the turn of the century in the 1900s. Uh, it had been around, but it wasn't something that most people dabbled in. It was for the rich people. Well, all of a sudden, people that began to have a little bit of money thought, hey, I can get rich fast. I can remember the day traders of the 19, late 1900s and early 2000s, you know, the people thought they were going to get rich. Uh, 
I had a an acquaintance. I won't call him a friend because he we really weren't friends. But he controlled a very large farm uh, in excess of two thousand acres, and he sold it. And I remember thinking at the time, what in the world is this guy thinking? You know, why would he sell this farm? Because you know, you don't make land is probably one of the best investments you can make. And uh, it was in a particularly good location that was near a municipality. And I was thinking to myself, what's he going to do? Well, he decided he was going to get rich, really rich. And he started playing the stock market and he lost everything. I mean, every dime he had, he lost. Uh, and that's kind of what happened in the 1920s. People begin to think, well, you know, I've got a little extra money here now. And they begin to kind of play around in the stock market. The average Joe, not the wealthy man. Uh, the problem was that you could actually buy stocks on what was called margin, which was on credit. You really didn't have to pay for them in the beginning. You could buy them and then 30 days later or 15 days later, you could pay for them. Well, if you were smart, and you knew what you were doing, you could invest in the stock market in a stock and watch it go up and sell it before you ever paid for it, which sounds really great on paper. Uh, unfortunately, most people aren't that smart. <laughs> you know, I'm sure not smart enough to know what to do about that kind of stuff. Uh, you can't do that anymore, by the way. Small investors speculated in the stock market with hopes they could sell their stocks before being required to pay for them, thus making a really nice little profit. Well, the result was when the stock market crashed uh, in 1929, people just lost fortunes. You know, uh, they lost everything they had because they had purchased, uh, you know, these stocks on credit thinking they could pay. For, and when it crashed just almost overnight, they were just bankrupt because they had no money to pay for this stuff. So that was the third reason. The fourth reason, third, pardon me, the second reason, the third reason was overproduction. Remember, the 1920s was a period of rapid industrialization, and this country just went full throttle making things. Uh, automobiles, uh, we began to make, you know, electrical appliances. I mean, just you name it, we were making it. We were making it to the point where people, there was too much of it. And, you know, as a result, People didn't have the money to purchase everything they wanted to purchase. The manufacturing of goods increased 32% between 1923 and 1929. That's, that's huge, folks. Uh, we talk about an increase uh, in the uh, economy today. If it goes up by 2 or 3% a quarter, we think that's fantastic. You know, I mean, just imagine what this percentage was going up. At the same time, the annual worker income was only rising about 8%. It was so much better than it had been, but it wasn't going up in relationship to the amount of goods. So the result was there were more goods available to purchase than there was money to purchase them, causing what's called deflation, a reduction in prices. Now, you might say, that, isn't that a good thing? Well, it's not a good thing if you're a company owner, <laughs> you know, it's not a good thing if you own one of these big companies, because all of a sudden you're stuck with all these uh, materials that you've built uh, and you don't have any way to sell them. It's kind of what happened uh, during that recession of 2007, 2009. You might remember the automobile companies were just in horrible shape because they had all these cars sitting around the lot. Now it's totally the opposite way. Now you can't find a car. And when you find one, it's too expensive to buy. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's just, you know, it's a totally different kind of situation than it was. So the fourth cause, well, the fourth cause is basic uh, of the Great Depression is that the government and the financial community actually almost encouraged the depression. Now, I don't think they set out and said, well, let's see what we can do to bankrupt America. They didn't do that. But they were so greedy themselves and so uh, inept that through their policies,
they actually encourage the depression to take place. For instance, banks encouraged buying on credit, which increased over 300% in the decade of 1920s. Folks, prior to the 1920s, it was a, people did not buy on credit. Now, some people learn their lesson. My dad, when I was growing up, I, like I said, I was born in 47, so I'm a, I'm a baby boomer. And my dad went through the Great Depression. And he, we had, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, we had very much nothing growing up as a young person in my house. I mean, because my dad refused to, to buy on credit. He said, if I can't pay for it, I don't buy it. And that's real great if you got money. Unfortunately, my dad was not a really uh, trained person. He, uh, he was a laborer, and he didn't make a lot of money. The result was we didn't have anything. The result was that, you know, a lot of poverty. So people learned their lesson to the extreme during the Great Depression. Uh, there was a, 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 you know, a lot of people buying stuff on credit prior to the Great Depression. After that, people just refused to buy it. The federal minimum wage was ruled unconstitutional in 1923, and wages stalled or began to regress. We had adopted a federal minimum wage for the first time in the early 1900s. And then all of a sudden, uh, it started, you know, they, they ruled that unconstitutional, and all of a sudden, wages kind of stalled or begin to regress. The Revenue Act of 1926 greatly reduced the federal income tax on the wealthy. So there was a, an income tax for the first time in American history. Prior to the early 1900s, there was no federal income tax. And then they passed the income tax, and then they ruled parts of it unconstitutional for a while. And the result was, again, people like Henry Ford were paying very little income taxes, if any at all. Government policies had encouraged manufacturing, but had ignored agriculture. Folks, I cannot tell you how important this was. Most people in America still made their living by farming in the 1920s. Now, that's not true today. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but I think it's around 3 to 4% of the American people today make a living through agriculture. Very, very small percentage. Um, and they do such a terrific job. I mean, uh, our, our agricultural workers are the backbone of this country, in my opinion, because, the, you know, we don't lack for food. We may have a hard time paying for it right now, but we don't lack for it. You know, for the most part, there's always food available to us. I, I've had conversations with people that have come to this country from foreign countries uh, I just recently talked to someone that came, that came here from the Ukraine as a refugee, and they were just amazed when they first walked into a grocery store. They 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 couldn't believe it. I mean, they said, we've never seen anything like this in our life. And the Ukraine was a pretty modern country compared to some. So, uh, you know, we, we do a great job today agriculturally, but, you know, it wasn't because of the government, and particularly back in this period of time. The government just ignored agricultural production. And finally, there was a lack of government regulation. They're basically the businesses, uh, the, the philosophy of business was stay out of our government, stay out of our business and leave it alone. And the government had done that. And the result was there was not a lot of regulation uh, in terms of production and uh, prices and things. The result was you had a lot of corruption. You know, uh, you know, people just, you know, it was a it was a pretty corrupt period of time. Uh, if you know anything about American history, you know that during the 1920s, particularly, there was a lot of political corruption going on. Uh, Warren Harding probably was as often considered one of the more corrupt presidents that we ever had. Wasn't that he wasn't a good man. He just really was playing the game compared to most presidents. So, all this come crashing down, October 29th, Black Thursday. I mean, it just, everything just fell apart, literally, almost overnight. Uh, I love this picture. This guy here is selling his car. $100 will buy this car. Uh, must, uh, see, must sell, lost all on the stock market. 
you know, and obviously that car is worth a lot more than $100, even back in those days when new cars didn't cost that much. Um, new York stock market totally collapsed on this date. It dropped 40% in one month. So let's, let's think about this today. Uh, let's say the stock market is running about 34,000 points right now. I think the Dow average is a little over 33, eight, something like that, 34,000. So let's say next month, all of a sudden it drops 40%. So how much are we talking? We're talking uh, close to 15,000 points. We're, we're talking almost in half of the stock market in one month. Can you imagine the amount of wealth that would be wiped out in this country if it dropped from 30 some thousand to 15,000 in, in a month, it would just be astronomical. 500 banks closed in the next 200 years, uh, and a lot of banks closed. Uh, unemployment increased from 3 million to 15 million by 1932. The national income went from 85 billion to 37 billion. Uh, boy, does that tell you something about our economy today? Um, 85 billion, um, you know, we have to talk in the trillions now. We don't talk in the billions anymore. You have to talk in the trillions. And I have a funny feeling by the time some of us are gone, uh, you'll be talking in terms of the hundred trillions. You know, it's just, you know, uh, the economy has just, you know, changed so dramatically in the last 60 or 70 years. Uh, now, how do most rural Ozarkers do during this well you know surprisingly most of them probably didn't feel that much different because most rural ozarkers were not enjoying the wealth of all this they already lived subsistence lives i just showed you a picture a few slides back of my mother and her grandfather uh and grandmother and that was right at the beginning of the great depression that wasn't after 10 years that was when she was just a young child. So that would probably have been about, she was born in 24. I'm still going to say that was probably about 33, something like that. So it would have been at the beginning of the Great Depression. They didn't have anything to begin with. I remember talking to my dad about the Great Depression when I got old enough to realize what had happened when I was really getting into history. And I said, Dad, tell me about the Great Depression. How did, how did it affect you guys? He just looked at me and laughed. He said, son, we didn't even know what was going on. You know, the Great Depression had no effect on my family at all because we didn't have anything. So the result of a lot of rural Ozarkers in the Great Depression was that it really didn't affect them that much. They didn't have any money. And if they had any money, they sure didn't keep it in the bank. Uh, barter was still pretty common. You know, if you had a dozen eggs, uh, you might trade that with a neighbor for, a, you know, a sack of flour. Uh, most of those workers had not participated in the boom of the 20s. My family, my mom and dad and grandparents, they would have never even dreamed of investing in the stock market. You know, they didn't have enough money to keep money in the bank. You know, so, you know, really, for the most part, Ozarkers just got by. You know, I love this picture because that, that's so typical. You know, if you know anything about people in the Great Depression and the Ozarks, you know they never threw anything away. I mean, not one thing did they throw away because you never know when you're going to need this. Uh, I was talking about this in, here at the township last week, and the lady was telling me the story about where they were in an attic and they found a jar of string and the string was all really short and it had a label on jar that said string too short to save but they saved it <laughs> you know uh i love that story you know they people did not throw anything away now today's generation of young people is totally different i i know my child and her husband are what we call minimalist. They absolutely don't want anything more than what they have to have. Uh, they don't have very much on the walls. Their furniture is nice, what they've got, but they don't have any more than what they need. 
you know, and they don't believe in going out and buying things to have in case you need it. You know, my generation, when we grew up, you know, um, we bought things and put them aside in case we needed it. And we didn't throw things away. I know I was a pack rat when I was younger. I didn't, well, <laughs> I was a pack rat till I moved into a senior living facility. Uh, and much to uh, the uh, resentment of my daughter who had to help me get rid of all the stuff during the, the sale. <laughs> you know, She said, why did you have all this stuff? Well, you never know when you're going to need it, daughter. Yeah, that's the depression mentality. So the traditional economic anchors, how did they fare in the Ozarks? Remember, up to the 1920s and through the 1920s, the economy of the Ozarks was based primarily on three things, uh, mining, lumber, and the railroad, and agriculture. So how did agriculture do? Well, government subsidies of agriculture had stopped after World War I. Crop prices had fallen. Wheat that had cost $2 a bushel in 1918 was down to only a few cents in 1929. Farmers had mortgaged their farms to buy mechanized equipment. Banks, in turn, foreclosed on all this. Agriculture didn't do very well in the Ozarks, folks. Uh, mining, mining had already pretty much stopped because uh, coal had begun to be replaced by hydroelectric power. We talked the last few weeks about all these dams that started being built. And on top of that, uh, the old uh, mining things of lead and zinc, which were the big mining things in the Ozarks, had begun to be replaced by man-made alloys. Now, we all know that lead has made a return because of battery production. But other than that, you know, mining really had already suffered. And then you got timber. Well, the railroads um, basically had stopped expanding after the Great Depression happened. They just, they kind of, they, they didn't fall apart. They just stopped. The result was you didn't need any more railroad ties because they weren't expanding the railroads. So the timber industry went down. So you saw a lot of this, folks. People selling their goods, selling their farms. Bankruptcy. You know, auction. Now, it wasn't as bad as the Okies and the Dust Bowl places where people just got up and left their farms and walked off. Uh, it was a lot worse out in the Dust Bowl, in Kansas and Nebraska and Oklahoma and, you know, Texas and these areas like this. It was a lot worse than what it was in the Ozarks uh, because they, they literally could not survive. Not at all. They couldn't even subsistence farm. Uh, you can at least still grow a garden in the Ozarks for the most part. Now, how did the urban Ozarks exist during the Great Depression? Well, simply, folks, um, it didn't really affect the urban Ozarks because there wasn't an urban Ozarks. Uh, the Ozarks of the 1930s was still rural. Look at this. There were only seven urban centers in the traditional boundaries of the Ozarks that had over 5,000 people in 1930. I want you to think about that for a second. Seven urban centers, towns, cities, whatever you want to call them, that had over 5,000 people. That's unbelievable to me. I mean, today, you know, that just doesn't happen. Look at this. Look, this is statistics, population statistics from 1930. Springfield had a little over 57,000 people, by far and away the biggest, you know, community in the Ozarks. Joplin was not that far behind at 33,000 because of all the mining. Carthage was the third largest town in the Ozarks at less than 10,000 people. Nevada had 7,500. I asked myself, why would Nevada? I mean, nothing against Nevada, but why did Nevada have a big population? And it dawned on me that Nevada was also had a mental hospital. You know, they had a hospital that took care of the mentally ill in the, in the uh, back in these days, that's what happened. They had state hospitals and Nevada had a big one. And uh, that's why their population was increased. Fayetteville, Arkansas, which was by far and away the biggest community in Northwest Arkansas on the Ozarks, only had 7,300, 7,400 people. Webb City had 68, Clinton, had 5,700. 
That's it, folks. There was not another town in the Ozarks in 1930 that had more than 5,000 people. So that's why the urban Ozarks didn't suffer, because there wasn't an urban Ozarks. It just didn't exist. Uh, here's Springfield. Uh, if you're not from Springfield or rent familiar Springfield, probably means nothing to you. But this is Kearney Street. And you can see the north city limits extended a little bit north of Kearney Street, kind of like it still does today. This is Glenstone. That was Glenstone. Of course, Springfield now just exists a long ways east of Glenstone now. This is what's called the bypass. And you can see the city limits was down around what we know as Scenic Avenue today. That's Scenic Avenue right there. And this is Sunshine. So South Springfield, as we know it today, this is the National Cemetery. The mall's down here, if you know anything about Springfield. And you know what's south of the mall a lot. Uh, and this was all out through here is now all part of Springfield, and it's nothing. You know, it didn't, it was all farmland. So Springfield, even Springfield was not a big city by any means at all, to say the least. So it took a lot longer for the Great Depression to hit Springfield. Uh, and like I said, even when it did, the effects were felt a lot less. The Frisco Railroad kept going. The Frisco was a big deal in Springfield, and it was also where the corporate headquarters were, where the repair facilities were. So, you know, they kind of helped. Even the old Springfield Wagon Company, which had pretty much gone down to almost nothing by in the 1920s, because with mechanization and cars and trucks and tractors, people no longer bought wagons to be pulled by horses. All of a sudden, you begin to see people going back to horse-drawn wagons because they couldn't afford a tractor. They couldn't afford a truck. They couldn't get gasoline. So they went back to drawing, you know, riding around in Springfield wagons. And all of a sudden, Springfield Wagon Company actually kind of surged during the 1930s. Uh, I know it may sound weird. On top of that, there was actually kind of a building boom going on during the Great Depression. In the, in the 1930s in Springfield, uh, most of it because of the government. You had the football stadium and the arena at SMS being built. Route 66 was being built. Springfield became the center of the Federal Medical Center, which was a big deal, a big employer, and uh, took a lot of people to build it. New airport, not the one we have now on the west side of town, new airport on the east side of town. You had the first two radio stations, KGBX and J KWTO. And they built a new federal building, which is now a city administrative building. So here was what we call FedMed, which is now in the center of Springfield. Back in those days, it was on the southwestern edge of Springfield. And there's a, a, a postcard of the federal building, which is now office buildings for the city. So how did the government try to cope with all this? Well, they tried to cope by... Uh, basically implementing what Franklin Roosevelt called his New Deal. And uh, we all, if you know anything at all about the 20s and 30s, you know about the New Deal. Uh, some of it was accepted by the Ozarks. For instance, the Civilian Conservation uh, Corps, there were over 70 camps in the Ozarks that housed young men, and they went out and they built parks, and they built fire towers, they planted uh forest, they built hiking trails, and a lot of what we have today in the Ozarks came from this Civilian Conservation Corps. There was also the very famous WPA. Now, there were lots of iterations of this. There were lots of different uh, alphabets, but the WPA is the most frequent one, where they actually put Ozark men and women to work building schools, bridges, parks, uh, courthouses, you can always tell what they are because they're all built out of native stone. And I'll bet you there's several of you sitting out there now thinking, I went to work for the WPA, and, or maybe your parents did, you know. Uh, and it was a great thing, and people liked it because they didn't feel like it was welfare because they were working for something. They were, doing, they were making a living, and the government was helping them out. On top of that, you begin to have the electrification of the Ozarks electricity came to the Ozarks. My mom and dad both 
told me they remembered the first time they ever turned the light switch on in their house. And I bet there's some of you out there saying, I can remember that day like it happened yesterday where you the first time you ever flipped the switch and saw a light bulb come on. Uh, my dad still remembered. He told me about the first time he ever saw a car in Nixon, Missouri. Some guy, he didn't know what it was. You know, some guy come driving down the street in this, whatever it was. All he'd ever seen was horses and buggies and wagons. And all of a sudden, here comes a car down the street. Uh, so this was what happened here. You can see, you can see the civilian conservation camps. You can see the linemen running electricity throughout the Ozarks. Uh, schools, here's an old WPA school, at Reed Springs. There's a bridge, uh, you know, built, you know, by the WPA. And you can always tell because they're always built on a native stone. You know, they didn't go out and, and process new stuff. So there were some agencies of the New Deal that weren't nearly as popular. Believe it or not, in the beginning, Social Security wasn't that popular because people didn't get it. You know, uh, it, it wasn't, it didn't make sense to them because you were given away your money for a later date. That was what their thought was in their mind. And it took a while for Social Security kind of to, to get settled in. I can guarantee you, folks, if you want to get the old people in this country riled up today, tell them you're going to do away with Social Security. It, uh, there would be a revolt. <laughs> you know, there would be, we would be walking down the streets for walkers with our pitchforks. <laughs> you know, uh, you just can't do away with Social Security. Everybody knows this, you know, and it, it turned out to be an absolutely fantastic thing. But in the beginning, a lot of people were a little leery of, of Social Security. They didn't quite understand how it worked. Even less so was something called the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, where the government was trying to reduce production of crops and goods because there was too much of it. And so they started buying up crops and burning them. They would buy up herds of livestock and slaughter them. Now, you try to tell that to somebody down in Ozark County, you know, how it makes sense for the government to come in and buy your crop of corn and then burn it down. You know, I mean, it just made no sense at all. It still doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Uh, I mean, I understand the economics of it, but it's, there's just something about it just doesn't look right. <laughs> you know, somebody can eat that corn, somebody can eat that hog, you know, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what they were doing. Um, so, yeah, Franklin Roosevelt didn't cancel the Constitution, but a lot of people thought he did, okay? Now, one last thing here, and then I've got to go. Um, it shouldn't surprise you that the Ozarks would elect a man as their congressman that was absolutely against all this New Deal politics. You know, we have a reputation in the Ozarks of being kind of anti-government. And we had one of the most fiercest vocal critics of the New Deal that represented us from the early 30s clear up into the 1950s, a man by the name of Dewey Short from Galena, Missouri. He served 12 terms between 1929 and 1957 as the congressman from the Ozarks. Now, folks, he wasn't he wasn't dumb. Uh, he wasn't your typical Ozarker. Not that Ozarkers are dumb. I don't I hope nobody took that wrong, but that's the impression a lot of people had. He had several advanced degrees from world-renowned universities. Uh, but folks, he knew how to talk to talk and walk to walk. People, he was he was able to come into homes and talk to people. And he was absolutely what we call a gadfly, a person that just pokes at the politicians. Look at a couple of his quotes here. Mr. Jefferson founded the Democratic Party and President Roosevelt dumbfounded it. You know, uh, I look at the Supreme Court and, Court and I know why Jesus wept. Now, as it turned out, Dewey Short was elected for a couple of terms and then he got, he got defeated. It only lasted for a couple of years, and then he came back into Congress, and the New Deal was really going strong. And this is a famous speech, part of a famous speech that he gave uh, 
when he rejoined the Congress. He said, I deeply and sincerely regret that this body has degenerated into a superfluous, subservient, soporific, supercilious, pulsonamious body of the greatest uh, beneath the dome of the national capital. I can't read all this because I'm out of the, uh, here we go. There we go. Uh, body of nitwits, the greatest ever gathered beneath the dome of the national capital, uh, who cowardly abdicate their powers in violation of their oath, turn over these constitutional prerogatives to a group of tax-eating, conceited, autocratic bureaucrats, a bunch of theoretical, intellectual, professional nincompoops out of the Columbia University who were never elected by the American people. The brain trusters and new dealers are the ones who wrote this resolution instead of the members of the House whose duty it is to draft resolution Congress. So you can kind of see that uh, Dewey Short was a thorn in the side of the New Deal. And here's Dewey sitting down at a Sunday dinner with some of his constituents. Like I said, he knew how to he knew how to get along with the people. And we elected him for almost 30 years. So that's where I'm going to stop today. I've got run out of time here. Next week, we're going to talk about the public enemy era. And we're going to concentrate on a specific event that occurred about four miles from where I live. It's not a pretty event. It's not a good event, but it's a story that needs to be told. And I think it's as good a way as any way to kind of end the study of our Ozarks history. So that's it for the day. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you learned a little bit about the depression. Not that some of you need to learn any about it, because like I said, you could probably teach me to But uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. So we will see you next week. And then the week after that, we're going to start talking about music of the 50s and 60s. We're going to go back and kind of refresh our memories of the soundtrack of our youth. And Donna, I don't want any dancing out there now when I start this. You know, you can't dance on me or anything. <laughs> I got Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel on a 45, and I played that over and over and over. <laughs> well, you, I think you will enjoy this, okay? I Have think so. Okay. okay. We will see you next week.